Okay, we enter summer of 41, and I, I gotta say, the turns, I don't know if they pass quicker because there's a lot of bookkeeping work and everything, but they're of a very different nature from whiffs. In whiffs, the combat segment of the game is quite heavy. It's not light here, but without the impulses in each turn, it, it proceeds somewhat more easily, I guess. There's still this interleaving that makes things hard, naval air. Well, mainly the thing that probably bugs me the most is the strategic warfare interleaving with the tactical operations on the map. Um, it's just where it happens, it's like I'm constantly forgetting to take care of, but that's okay. It's like forgetting the Russians, you know. They take their turn. It'll happen eventually. I found these chips uh, for economic penetration. They're not terribly useful because there isn't, for example, uh, an Italian one or a British one but you know, I can put something in there to remind me. Or I could dig up the trade packs, which I'm beginning to dig things out of uh, Gathering Storm. I'm kind of wishing I hadn't put it away, except it was taking up a counter tray. I could have put it over there or something. Uh, just a tray of the things I might need, but I wasn't sure what I would need. So, let's see. We did the research. We got a few interesting things there. For one thing, the Germans picked up a spy ring and chose to throw it into Turkey. Now the Allies picked up a counter spy, but, or counter espionage or whatever, counterintelligence, and they decided not to play that against the Turk, Turkish spy ring, because they're not terribly interested in that. They want to prevent something that's going to directly affect them. Spain would be interesting to them, um, perhaps Sweden, or trying to spy on their research, which would kind of piss them off. <clears throat> Spiring isn't as impressive, I think, here as in research as it is in Gathering Storm. In Gathering Storm, it gives you an extra point that you can spend and allocate to research to whatever you like. Here it only gives you a bonus in general research. In addition, though, it gives you information about the other guy, and it gives them a penalty on general research, which, of course, means if they've got a spy ring on them, they're going to stop the general research, and that, that could be painful. Uh, a while back, I was talking and said some bullshit uh, or incorrect things about uh, when you do a production event on a specialized unit. When you do that, you just get one strength point, period. You don't get any carryover or anything. So the Russians had some carryover from that. They don't get that. And we're really wishing we had built our transport since we're building paratroopers for some reason. And a number of countries are doing this. The final kind of interesting thing is the Russians, uh, every, every side is kind of investigating atomic research. Well, the Russians, had the bad result from that. Uh, they ended up getting a core meltdown and they're now forbidden from doing any controlled reaction and without that you can't go any further. Uh, they pretty much screws the points they've put into here. They're done with atomic as far as they're concerned. They're not interested terribly in getting radar. So uh, although they have a big bonus in their general research for atomic, they're, they're wiped out. Um, and I guess we run over to the Axis player turn and start the diplomacy up real early today. Okay, um, so I opened the turn up with the Axis with a declaration of war. I did no diplomacy. The reason is, for the same reason that everyone else is kind of holding back on diplomacy, you want to let the other guy force them to play some of their handout, show them what you've got. So although I placed here, and that's almost a... A marker on it. It's not like anybody's going to be able to slip anything in there. So uh, I'm willing, unless Russian tensions go up ridiculously high, I'm willing to hold off and see, hey, does anything get triggered? Obviously Turkey's not going to get triggered by, by the Russians or the allies from that. But I laid a declaration of war on Denmark and Norway. That's a combined declaration for 10 points, so I don't know what my chances of Norway are. I cheated a little bit, SR'd, uh, retroactively SR'd some units so that I can sail my fleet over, pick up some infantry, and try to make an invasion over here south of Oslo. And 
uh, see what we can get out of that. We'll probably see the British intervention, although the Brits have committed so heavily to Egypt. Uh, Italy not declaring war. In fact, I got trouble with Italy. Croatia, although in gathering storm it says it's an Italian client state, there doesn't seem to be anything in there that indicates any kind of um, special status beyond uh, an economic penetration. So uh, that's all I've given it. And that's not enough to get to Serbia. The only way I could get to Serbia is through Greece. That looks difficult. And I also kind of don't want to attack Serbia with the Italians. I kind of want to shift that over uh, to the Germans. The Germans, like I said, they don't have enough B BRPs right now. Uh, anyway, moving onward, counter air, and no, I'm not going to cheat this time. <laughs> the massive Luftwaffe uh, attack on France was so effective. Now, um, yeah. Uh, but I've managed to brush aside the RAF. I've got a couple of units that can go in and try to do strategic bombing. Now, doing strategic bombing with regular units is not that helpful uh, or not that powerful. It helps, but uh, what I'm going to be doing is you only get like a third of your, your Army Air Force, uh, Army Air Factors going in that actually count as bombers but that's still better than i can do i have no strategic bombers i'm in range i can bomb london and i can do some damage that way and we'll see where we end up in the long run uh, so i don't know where we go next i'll try to report on things as they happen although i may try to jump in and do the invasion online the the trouble with me doing things online is I do the things online the first time I do them, and that's when I know them the least. But uh, I do want to get some practice in with invasions so that I'm better prepared for coping with the Pacific. And so that seems like a good idea. The problem with this system is you've got a lot of stuff in the air at once. Um, with generally, hey, you know, you allocate your air attacks, you resolve them. You allocate this, you resolve it, right? Here, I've got stuff allocated. So I've got this air attack already allocated, but it's not been resolved yet uh, on London for the strategic bombing. And I'm in the midst of also handling my naval invasion. It's just, you've got this huge stack of information in play that it can be very, very difficult, I think, uh, to maintain what's going on and then of course I forget what I'm doing here which is I need to get some Italians into ports or whatever so that I can pick them up deliver some of them at least I'm not bringing all of that <laughs> otherwise Italy will fall uh, down to uh, Libya uh, unfortunately for the Italians they have a very tiny army they, they focused too much on air power I think and ended up with not a lot so I'm gonna have to start developing their ground forces that's not too bad it's cheaper I think well either way you get it based on BRPs uh, I've taken Denmark. I don't know if there's any other ground movement I wanted to do, probably, and I haven't done that either. Uh, but I have to worry because there's, a, I think, an interception possibility even across uh, the different theaters when I attack. I'm going to try to keep it as far as possible as I can, and I'm also going to, I also have an advantage, which is that the Brits sent out a task force. I don't know how big it is but they sent out a task force into the Atlantic. So maybe they'll just ignore me. Maybe they're too weak to, to cope with this invasion. Or maybe they'll just fail. We'll see. Okay, well, the Allies can't intercept across the Skagerrak. So there's, the reason is, unless they have friendly control of the strait, they're not allowed to go through it. So there's no problem there. And the Germans are gonna be able to make their attempt um, I chose not to send armor up there. I figure I'll fight my way through the Norwegians. We'll see how that all works out. We'll probably end up... Let's drop an air... Oh, we can't. 
Well, we're going to have to end up uh, moving some air power into place slowly. But, you know, we wanted the free, free declaration of war, as it were, against Norway. We want to get Norway... So Norway is problematic for the Germans because, one, or valuable to them. Uh, first of all, if they don't go after it at all, the Allies can mine the Norwegian uh, coast, and that prevents the Swedish iron ore from coming through. So if the Allies don't get a diplomatic result on Sweden that prevents it, th at the very least they can prevent it that way. That'll piss Norway off if Norway's not in favor of uh, the Allies already, which could be uh, a real difficulty. Um, they can't mine the coastline if the Germans own Norway, though. <clears throat> the other factor, uh, another, another factor, has to do with Bergen, but before we get to that, German uh, nuclear research is, or atomic research is based on them having access to the heavy water that's available in Norway. It's going to be their only legal source or legitimate source for it. So if Norway is pissed at them, uh, they won't be able to deliver that. And I, th I don't know if mining affects that as well, but they get a penalty there. And then finally, Bergen itself is very valuable because they can send raiders up to Bergen without getting intercepted. This is the Bismarck scenario, and then slip them out into the SW box. And that's a, a, a sweet little maneuver that allows them to continue raiding uh, even after they lose the initial force that's out there. The subs can get out for free. They don't have to worry. Uh, so... That will be that, and we'll go on with the actual invasion. And we'll, we sent the entire German Navy out. No reason not to. It doesn't really have much other purpose. And we need a certain amount of destroyers to escort uh, the infantry going in. I think it's two per for the invasion, so because it's a contested hex, so it's uh, somewhat problematic. But had the Allies been able to uh, intercept in this space. If they intercepted in this hex itself, they would end up getting uh, a total of four dice, and they have to roll the distance or greater. And the reason it's four dice, there's a whole calculation. A couple of dice for, you know, transported units. Uh, I don't remember what else. Oh, we were playing these, which we will not play. Those canceled each other out. But there were just a, a number of factors in play that added up to four dice. Uh, the Brits have some slow ships so that that reduces their dice, but you know, just it all it all worked out to that, and uh, they would have uh, had a fair chance of hitting the German fleet, which probably is still to the British advantage. The Royal Navy is still pretty big, even though I sent I sent the biggest battleships out here. The four pointers out there. I can't send a five pointer out there because I don't have a five point research result. Even though I have a five point battleship, I'm not allowed to send it to see the out to hunt raiders. Uh, all right, well, we'll follow the sequence and see what else we have. While we're in the midst of all of this and whatever else, now we jump back and have to take care of raiders and the strategic warfare. So, you know. Whatever I may have calculated there, which I didn't, but I uh, just kind of played it by ear, that calculation's out of my head now. I guess maybe I could write little sh scraps of paper to keep track of what's going on, or, you know, use dice or something to keep numerical results in mind. But, um, so I guess the raiders are done first. Let's see, we're going to be rolling a die. We're going to use one raider group to hunt the transports there. So we get minus three. Now I did this over in the uh, North Atlantic and I'm probably gonna screw up because I don't really remember the rules. Um, I get a minus three base. The Raider group controls three ships, so I'm up to minus two. Air range research results. I don't think the allies have any of those, but I'm not sure. Nope. <laughs> yeah, the amount of lookups you have to do is rough. Uh, no CVEs. 
Code breaking advantage. Okay, well we have to look up to see what kind of code breaking works on this. I'm guessing it's strategic. Uh, yeah, let's just let's just throw strategic at it. And both had one strategic that they will use for this, so they cancel each other out. There's no advantage. You kind of don't want to throw two ch two cards for this unless you know you're not going to be facing another situation where that card would be valuable, because the most you can get is a one point advantage. You could be playing kind of a ah, I'll hold my single card. Uh, Maybe play a blank or something or nothing. It's it's not clear how, how you know to me how the the revelation of the cards is. Uh, it's probably written out in the rules uh, so that it's kind of a simultaneous. Uh, so we need a one or greater. Ah, oh, wait, this doesn't even happen yet. I think we get first the chance to hunt the raiders. I gotta go look and see what the chance of that is. All right, and that's what this table's about. So we were at a minus two, and there's only one raider group, so we only roll once to see how many uh, defending ships can engage it. And now that there are defending ships, we'll see. Well, we missed them on the approach. We'll get another shot at them, I guess, uh, when we hit the, uh, hit the other side of it. And did we play those strategic cards? Uh, so now I think we just get to shoot at the transports, which will be over on the naval. Oops, <laughs> that's kind of weird. Um, over on the naval attack table. Now, over here I've got Task Force Two. Take a look over here. I got six strength points. Boom, boom, boom. I get to shoot them up. Modifiers? Okay. Um, Naval Nationality DR. I'm not sure if that's moved yet. Western Allies don't have one. Axis. Well, they have one. They both have a negative two. Which is good. Um... Well, it's actually a positive two in here. I don't know why they're represented as negatives. Uh, dee, 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 dee. <sighs> I don't know if these guys are carrying out a naval activity which reduces their effectiveness. They were. <laughs> they're not at this moment being intercepted by anything, so that's not really an issue. Uh, so I think the answer is no, they're not. I say making it up, because I am tired of looking things up in the rules. So, we're at even, looking at six, and we roll big. So I guess we hit two of these transports. And that'll hurt, you know, remember, we're, we're already under, under the limits. Now, I think we go back to the raider table and see... Yep, annoying robot. And see if we can um, I must return to port. Hmm. Wow, I cheated. Those raiders shouldn't still be out there. What happens with this? When raiders, once the first round of naval combat between the raider group and any defending naval units which engaged them and raider attacks against, they must then attempt to return to port. Damage defending naval units must disengage. Before the raiders return to port, yeah, why didn't we have that before this? Um, we make another raider roll. Now, slow ships can't be out in the SW box, so I don't know how they would engage. Uh, but again, we're at minus two. 
we get a destroyer factor up against them. Now the Brits actually have a destroyer out there. Maybe they shouldn't because of this. Uh, yeah, we have some destroyer factors. So now, <laughs> uh, the Germans come in with six strength points to the Brits with one. And the Germans get a four. We're gonna kill that destroyer. The one does one point of damage, which isn't sufficient, I believe, to damage. Uh, it's one less than the ships can take, so one of their ships is damaged. Uh, so, let me grab one of these and put it over on something to indicate that I've hit one of these. And I've got to reduce the destroyers available as well. Uh, they don't go there, they go back into the box. So I'll be back. So the Allies are going to attempt two interceptions. Now, because I don't want the slow ship penalty, I'm not going to send the slow battleships out against this. I know I can't intercept anything else, and I know what the German Navy is out for. So for this one, this Task Force 1 here, I guess, uh, where are the slow battleships? Huh, I guess they weren't there. Uh, Task Force 1, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 hexes away. And now I have this. Um, I get one die for the task force. And that's about it. I'm not going to be able to catch them, obviously. From this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 or so hexes. And I think that's equally bad. So we're going to make it in to Brest, uh, Bray. And, you know, the distance is just going to be more than the one die that we can intercept a small force like that. So that has made it throw. And now we go to the bomb, uh, we go to the submarines and the bombing, and I need a break. Okay, let's see if we can get the submarine warfare going here. Um, this is going to use, so one of the problems is both the sub and bomber uh, warfare are split between two sections. One section is the strategic warfare section, and then there's special sections on subs and um, the bomber campaigns. But you kind of need to have them both, and they, again, are, are weaved together. So, like, specifics about subs are handled here in the strategic warfare section. That's what I'm going to keep mainly open, but, you know, there's only so, so much of this I'm going to just keep rereading I've done it once before, so screw it. I'm going to try to guess uh, how it works, right? Okay, so the Germans get two dice on their table. The Brits will get two dice on their table. The Brits are going to be using their AS... Well, the Allies are going to be using their ASW factors. They have seven. The Germans only have three U-boats. DRM, I think we determined there wasn't anything. Uh, attacker torpedo results... That one we haven't checked, and I believe I have some. So I have one result, so the Germans are at plus one now. Oh, Defender ASW Research. They have two, so now uh, actually it's the Allies who are going to be a plus one. So this is treated as a negative. To, uh, so actually the ally, uh, the Germans are at minus one now. Now, for the ASWs themselves, they also roll on here as far as I can tell, but they're not listed with any modifiers, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if they get anything there. It's 
see this is so screwed up. I thought these went reverse. Maybe it's explained over here. Oh, there isn't a lot in here. Oh, we have additional modifiers though. Okay, so the Germans are at minus two. Ah, we reverse it for the ASW. Great. Okay, so right now Germans are at minus two. But we have a French port, so we're at zero. I don't think we have a diplomatic role. Ultra code breaking. What kind of code breaking do we use here? I think it's tactical. I'm not sure where it'll say that. Modifiers? You think? Yeah. Uh, I think it's tactical, so that's what I'm going to... Oh no, it's uh, sub versus ASW. And we clearly want to play all our cards for this. This is actually where uh, both sides, I think, have focused. And they end up tying out here with sub versus ASW. Okay. So we're at a zero, and both sides are at zero. Let's make a roll. The Germans get a nine with, I said, three subs. That's going to be one one. They destroy a transport and they damage a transport. Crap. I don't have any ones here. So one's in the sunk box, and one's over here waiting for repair or something. Okay, what about the allies? They got a six, but they've got seven. So they get a one four. What are defender's results? Eliminated before reaching the defender's convoys, and others just fail to hit additional losses. So the Germans are losing a sub. Unfortunately I didn't leave it's in place. Two of them are still out here. I think they flip over but it, I don't think it makes a damn bit of difference. This one goes into the allowable builds and this is here. Okay well then we look to see about additional losses. We had no modifiers in our favor. Um, we didn't reach the convoys with any of our subs, so we don't cause any additional. So that's how that ends up working out. And we can flip these U-boats. They've made their attack. Just to help remind me where I am. Now we do the same thing over with the air. There are no defensive factors for the air. Uh, air nationality DRMs. I don't think we had any uh, any difference between them. No jets. Radar. The allies do not have radar yet. They're close. Uh, These aren't strategic bombers. However, I think we have to uh, we have to cope with this because otherwise it doesn't make sense. have no strategic bomber. They have an air defense. The Allies have an air defense modifier. I don't think we have any range modifiers. 
We're not allowed to use them to improve our range, but they affect the die roll. Air defense, did we say they had one? Yeah, they have an air defense. So right now, it's at one, minus one. Okay. So we're hitting with what amounts to three bombers at minus one. They have a point for their airbase counter. Uh, I'm sorry, for the objective symbol. There's a city there, so that puts them up to three points. And that's it. So it's three versus three with a penalty on the Germans. Okay. We're gonna get a 1-1. One, one. And we get a 0-2. What does that mean? Uh, the defender loses two BRPs which we flip over to here. Hopefully keep not losing our place in the sequence of play. Uh, find the Western Allies. Summer of 41, I guess. And we had two BRPs. There may be more coming. Uh, the number before is the number of bombers which are eliminated before they reach. The number of after are those that are kind of aborted in path. Uh, we said one and one. So we're going to destroy one German air factor. Don't worry about the escorts here. And you can see doing this with, you know, regular air units is probably not most effective thing to do uh, but I want to try to cut down British BRPs as much as I can it affects their surrender level if I remember to check that uh, now are there additional losses we do not do any additional um, Losses because we, we, we did not have modifiers in our favor. Did I put the minus one in? I hope so. Uh, let's see. Should have been. We should only be one BRP, not two. Okay, but I gotta keep track of the additional losses here. Um, bombers that hit the target. Okay, so we took two out one makes it to the target that's three more BRPs so we're gonna do a total of one plus three is actually four BRPs in bombing losses okay. and <laughs> these make it back and I think that's it for our strategic warfare not terribly effective. Okay, so for the seaborne invasion, as they're very specifically called, as opposed to naval invasion, or just invasion. Um, it's technically correct. It's just annoying to me when I look up in the uh, index and it says, go see this. But it makes sense because there's multiple things. So I've got six strength points of infantry coming in. Now, unlike the air support, which I looked up to make sure I was correct about, the naval support is limited based on the DRM of the Navy. Uh, the German DRM of two means I can put twice as many forces in. That's limit caps at three. But if you have a DRM uh, of one, you can only put one times the ground forces in. So I'm going to be able to get 12 strength points of Navy in here, and I have that with these battle cruisers and some other things too, but um, I don't think destroyers can do it. I don't know about cruisers, but I'm pretty sure any named ships can. So I have 18 strength points. Now these guys have their normal 
DRM of two for defense plus another one for the invasion. Unless, uh, I'm trying to remember what it is, unless uh, some proportion is Marines, like over half the force is Marines. Even if they're being attacked from other sides, just using the, the naval support screws up your, your uh, defensive multiplier. So these guys are six and I've got uh, 18. So I've got a three to one attack coming in and it really is just a three to one attack except for uh, presumably what happens if I fail. Let's not fail. <laughs> then we don't have to look that up because I'm curious. Do I have multiple rounds? I suspect I do, but I don't know. I get a six, which means boom, I'm in. That's going to allow me to drop a bridgehead in there. And uh, I'll put these over with the Brits because if they end up surviving, which I believe they will, will do because I'm not taking the capital, uh, the Brits will be able to start supporting them and get some forces into play. Denmark has no forces, so it was trivial to take. I just marched that armor up there. Uh, my boat goes back and I'll send it back here. I could recharge it right now if it can't go back there, but I believe it can. It started here, sailed through here, and then over. Uh, you can pick things up on, on your invasion route. Uh, so I grab my, yeah, let me just, I'll fade out. And to catch up over on the Pacific front, because I don't want to do both at once, it's just, that's too much for me. Uh, although, I kind of catch up to this point, that's all. I'll go back and then handle every, all the purchasing and everything. Uh, the Japanese, thinking about the possibility of trying to smash their way into Chongqing using, you know, actual attacks. They choose not to. They spent another six, wiped out another partisan. Got a nice big roll on their attrition table. Didn't get any hexes. They were denied the one hex they could have gotten. I don't know how valuable that is, but the Chinese can then, you know, repopulate that. So there's, they're keeping some padding there, even if we don't have any anywhere else. And we, uh, took some losses over here simply because these forces aren't doing me any good. Now they end up in the isolated box, they're harder, they'll take longer to rebuild, but that's that's okay. Well, we really got to get more of our force over here. And actually, you know, if the Japanese are not going to attack those reduced spaces, well, we'll try to tempt them by reducing the strength. Now they're down to two points each. Uh, <laughs> but it's four because the mountains cancel out the, uh, the penalty for being isolated. And uh, the Japanese did move some forces closer to the front so that they'll have more power to punch through if they need to. So uh, we got to keep that in mind. The Russians ought to be moving, I forgot last turn, they ought to be moving some of their uh, forces out of Siberia because the Japanese pulled some of them out of Manchuria up to the limit that they're allowed to pull out. Uh, that frees up Russian forces. Of course, Russia could declare war on Japan, but uh, that's kind of not a good idea, I think. So, uh, yeah, we'll let Japan just wear itself out over in China. And then we go to the build phase. So the axis set of the turn ends with uh, uh, U.S. axis tensions going up enough that there's another mobilization in place. <coughs> um, and we got Germans built a battleship. They started laying down a couple of carriers instead. Uh, I gotta build myself some naval air support, but if I'm gonna fight a naval war, I need more than I have right now. And Italy's a hard sell to get into this war because they're facing larger forces in Egypt than they have available and they just don't have a very big army and Germany can say yeah I'll back you up I'll back you up but Italy's just kind of geez I, I don't know you know <laughs> it doesn't seem seem to my advantage to join this war um, 
Of course, if no one ever declares war on Italy, and they don't declare war, they win the game, but uh, the Allies can always declare war on Italy, clean up that fascism problem in Europe once and for all. Not that they would do that. They didn't go after Franco. They didn't, you know. <laughs> so, anyway. In a lot of ways, what we're seeing with Gathering Storm is that it's kind of accelerated the game to the point that <coughs> I think there's still a fair world at war game in, coming, at least in Europe. And obviously, nothing affected the Pacific, so that's got to be fair, too. The reason it's fair is U.S. entry is so boosted that there's not going to be a lot I can do, you know? I look at, well, maybe I can take Britain out. No, there's not time. I've, I've, got, uh, I've got the U.S. coming in really shortly. I've got to start on Russia, I feel like. Or else, maybe, ignore Russia completely. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is eventually Russian tensions will go up. And I've got these problems like the economic penetration of the Balkans which worries Russia, right? So, seeing as I've already got that diplomatic factor in that side, I feel like I've got to move against Russia at some point. Uh, for Italy, it's really tough. They don't, don't have the forces to face the Brits in Egypt. And these other factors that, like, it's going to take a while to develop, like bringing Turkey in as an ally, or... Uh, I don't remember what else I was considering. But, um, well, honestly, bringing, bringing the, the, uh, the Balkan states in, it's not going to be trivial. And we have this, wow, how, how are we going to make it happen? You know, because uh, we've got this really short timeline. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be 42 before I can do any of these things. And U.S. entry is creeping up there. I don't remember what I'm at right now. Yeah, I'm at 44. I mean, that's that. It, it, they're triggered at 50. And uh, there's just not a whole hell of a lot. Wow. Well, I think I kind of screwed up with the allies. I'm gonna look at the camera to make sure I'm in focus or something. Um strategically choices. The U.S. mobilization, I built more ground forces with it. I need to start getting some shipbuilding built because I want to get CVEs out there <coughs> to help prevent the uh, submarines. And the Germans really don't have many subs for this time of the war, for this level of U.S. commitment. This is really a problem from their side. Uh, I also wondered, gee, what happened to the Flying Tigers? Well, they don't show up until U.S. tensions get to a certain, U.S.-Japan tensions get to a certain point, which those tensions are not, because the Japanese are uh, keeping them really low somehow. I don't understand what's going on there. I'm going to have to double check. But basically, I think we're moving into the fall turn with very little happening. The British uh, intervened in Norway, and that's going to, yeah, except they didn't get to there. They can't SR to there. Okay. Uh, they intervened in Norway. Um, main point of that is to be able to prevent the heavy water and the, uh, the shipping advantages of Oslo. It's one of the few places we can actually do anything. We built our planes further back up here in Liverpool, and God knows what else. Uh, yeah, oil is not as impressive as I thought. You know, I was really intrigued with oil when it allowed you to unflip your units more often. It became a really key factor. Now it's simply a limitation, um, for good or bad. It, it returns to feeling like the old Third Reich system without the oil. Uh, it should serve as a nice limitation, though, um, as the war continues, say, on Germany, on Japan, when they don't have the oil uh, access as easily. So it will direct their, their principal, their, their, their activities. But it doesn't give me the whiff-like ability that the headquarters uh, do to, hey, I'm just going to keep using my planes or whatever. Um, it was a bit crazy at the level 
that it was that it looked like it was happening here, and France fell easily because of it. Um, I am really not convinced that Gathering Storm gave the Germans a huge advantage here. I mean, they totally ran the board on Gathering Storm, and I, I don't think they're in particularly good shape because of it. <laughs> The one thing that really affects the U.S. Japanese, yes, I've been keeping the tensions down, but the thing that really affects them is, uh, yeah, capture of Paris is one time. Thought that was going to be a biggie. No, I'm not seeing it. I'm just not seeing it. <laughs> so sorry. It looks to me like Japan can. You know, I was thinking maybe the German war, because if you look over here, the Russia-German tensions are also affected by the Allied powers being at war. Yeah, but that's not coming into play here. So we're here in, you know, 41 with pretty limited tensions. It may spike, especially if I start doing offensives in China, but I haven't needed to. Okay, so on the axis turn, fall of 41, uh, I didn't make a weather roll up in the Northeast Asia because, well, North Asia, because it really doesn't make much difference. There isn't anything going on in Manchuria. I'm doing a diplomacy trigger. I'm doing Turkey. I had plus three dip points in Turkey. And I have this spy uh, point in there. And that gives me a net of plus two because the Russians had a point which gets expended and then that actually just goes down to plus one because of the turkey uh, turkey has a an inertia modifier so I'm probably not going to get much of anything but we'll roll and see what we get all right we got to a six which means turkey continues any pro-axis policies uh, and cancels and uh, allied policies there's no real reason not to do this and essentially this keeps me at a three to four result which means nothing um, so you know hey maybe if I had rolled uh, one higher I would have gotten uh, some money from Turkey each turn I guess from uh, the economic penetration that would cause some issues but you know it's so hard to trigger them in as long as anybody's putting any defenses in and you don't have a limitation to how many points you can put into anything. So that's that. Right, so Italy's decided to declare war on the Brits. That affects U.S. tensions. U.S. is just about ready to come in, which is one of the reasons I had to do it. Uh, otherwise, you know, Germany would be fighting alone against the U.S. and Britain and eventually Russia. And Italy can be cleaned up, you know, as needed, but they don't provide any any help anymore to Germany for the rest of the game. So once the U.S. enters the war, the Italians can't declare war. One of the first things that I have to consider is supplying Libya. Well, I don't have a massive uh, ability to launch any kinds of attacks out here, uh, out of Libya. So... What I'm looking at for supply is basically, all right, I'm just going to trace the line. If it doesn't work, I've got to trace back to Tripoli for limited supply. It just means, you know, my armor and my air doesn't work very well. But that's okay. And I think I may take a CTL loss. But that's okay, right? Uh, on the other hand, the British fleet would have to intercept that supply source, and then the Italian fleet could... Uh, force a showdown against what's probably an inferior fleet coming out of Malta. So that seems like a reasonable option to try, you know, and the Brits aren't going to fall for this. They're, they're, you know, chances are that the Italians will be able to intercept them in their route. The only thing is the Brits could intercept somewhere off here conceivably, but it's far away, you know, <laughs> if they do that. It, it's an unlikely interception for them. They don't end up spending their, their fleet, though, if they do that. So it might make sense to try to interdict supplies somewhere closer to here. Uh, it's easier for them to interdict the supplies than for the Italians to catch the Brits. On the other hand, 
that if it's successful, it uses up the British fleet in the Mediterranean, which we may not want to do. So I think we're going to let them get their supplies through and see if they end up transporting troops. That would be worth interdicting probably. Okay, I guess I'm taking care of this before I take the naval stuff for whatever reason. But um, the German strategic bombing rate is coming again, and it's like 25 factors. Now, those aren't all bombers. 19 of them are escorts. Only six of them are bombers. And the Allies are back here with only six strength points of air units. Now, they have two choices. They could either just not contest it, which might be the best move, but it's not like I have a significant number of additional air units available to me. This is the best I can kind of do is achieve these odds. So I don't know if I should just let the Germans hit me or take the additional BRP losses of fighting at a three to one, you know, odds in the air combat. Um, you know, if I'm giving them what, 19 planes here, an average roll is going to do quite a bit of damage. It's going to wipe me out probably. Whereas my six planes might reduce some of their bombers. That's one of the factors is the losses are uh, assigned equally essentially. Uh, so I can reduce the cost of the bombers and I think that's probably worthwhile because the bombers can do quite a bit of damage. So we're going in and we'll see what comes of that. What are our modifiers? I don't know. I got to look up my tech again for everybody. Okay, Western Allied, first radar. We didn't get to any radar and I don't think there are any DRM modifiers on either side, so that I was pretty sure of, but okay. Uh, so I guess we have no modifiers here at all. And let me just see it. And 19 at 6 going to be six destroyed. Okay. What about six at nine? Okay, so we're doing seven hits. Three destroyed air factors, four aborting. Let's take their losses and I'll resolve those and then probably come back after all the all the strategic warfare. I'm not sure. Limited results across the board. Uh, the bombing, I don't remember what it did, it five, six points. I have to look back through the charts, I don't know. But not a lot of BRP loss. I did take out the British planes, but I took almost as many in losses. So, you know, uh, the Raiders failed, got them damaged again. Remember to put them in here this time. Uh, and the subs. I'm so outnumbered in terms of ASWs that are on the board that I managed to get a good roll and do some damage, but I also lost a sub and took some damage uh, uh, and, and took a couple that didn't make it through. Uh, I actually think I did something though, because I should have had plus one on the die roll, and I think I misallocated there should be another damaged sub or another damaged transport and I had a modifier in my favor which means one additional transport is sunk for that okay so yeah I had a modifier on the die roll that I forgot about and didn't apply that took out one more sub uh, one more transport uh, to the damaged level. This would be a destroyed one though, right? Yeah, this is a destroyed. So one of these is destroyed. So I actually did a fair amount of damage uh, to their transport capabilities and they take BRP losses for every one under 30 and there are less than 30 there in total. 
15, 21, 23, 26, 27, 28. We don't even have 30 possible, so until we get that up to uh, up to snuff there, uh, the Brits are going to be taking BRP losses for not sufficient shipping uh, for the wartime effort. But, you know, this is a heavy expense for the Germans. They spent 15 to launch an offensive action. Now, they are still picking off Norway, so <laughs> it may be worthwhile for that. But it looks like it's not a good payoff. Um, the naval raiders, I think those don't count against. I'm not sure. You may have to pay to do raiding as well, which, you know, that's counted in my 15 but if I'm not, you know, conducting military operations in Norway and using these planes, maybe the Raiders aren't that great a buy either. They managed to knock off a cruiser. <laughs> they didn't find the transports, though. I more or less completed everything I want to do in Europe. Now I shift over to Asia, and I have a real problem here. This is really the turn where I kind of have to decide, am I going to go for Chongqing or not? Um... Yes, I could have done it last turn, but what I'm finding, first of all, I can't exploit through the mountain hexes, which means I'm not going to be able to bust through here and just crush Chungking easily. It's going to be a hard task. Um, the second thing is, to get any kind of odds against one of these mountain hexes, there's two strength points there. It's got a DM of three. If I don't, you know, get a, a modifier on the Chinese resistance, which I think is brown, what's Yen in? Is that here? No. I don't know where Yenin is. I wonder if I own it. Hmm. Is it up here? Yeah, okay. So that's also worth a resistance point, but uh... If I uh... If I can't take Chungking, first of all, Chungking is worth money. It's worth 20 bucks to me and 20 bucks to the Chinese. And oh no, it's only worth five. What the hell? Huh. Okay, I don't know where the Chinese money is coming from. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up. I thought it was a 20 buck shift. And I'm like, well, that would be a big deal. The five buck shift is also a big deal in the sense that there will be more uh, more nationalist units that will be hard to rebuild. If I have that, I get the bonus for Chungking itself. And I guess that's about it. Uh, but it's going to take a significant number of points to get down to where I at all want to go which is down here at minus three, all nationalist Chinese take a minus one DM. Uh, that would be helpful. It would allow me to kind of overrun China from that point. Um, and then eventually the goal is the minus five, which collapses the nationalists. But <sighs> launching attacks with everything is gonna cost me two things. One. It cost me 15 BRPs, okay, big. Well, it cost me more than two things. It cost me a number of things, but uh, one is, I, I can think of three right off the bat at this point now. Uh, one is the uh, BRPs for attacking. You know, that's pretty minimal. I, I don't care about the 15 BRPs if I'm gaining commiserate gains. Two, if I spend over eight or seven, yeah, over eight, um, or over seven, eight or more, I end up uh, affecting U.S. tension by a point. Hmm. Okay. Well, in order to get better than 
in order to get two to one or better here, that's going to happen. And then in order to get three to one or better, I have to spend the full 15, which means no attrition attack. And no attrition attack's a big deal. I'm doing a lot of damage with the attrition, but I'm not going to gain ground with attrition. And uh, it might be worth going with like a two to one attack here, taking additional losses just so that I can inflict the uh, attrition losses as well and I, I'm kind of leaning that way but it, it's, it's a tough tough decision and of course also if I'm launching a limited attack here that means no attacks on the partisans which I kind of like knocking out to reduce I don't know because they cost a lot for the Chinese to build etc but I gotta see where the Chinese money is coming from if they if Chongqing's only worth five uh, I'm not sure where their rest of their income comes from I ended up settling on the all-out all assault and uh, gained a couple of key hexes. Also took this, which I don't know why, and took out both partisans. You know, increased the cost on the Chinese as much as possible. Increased the amount of lost units. They're going to be looking at uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I missed by 1 unless that's by factor. It's by factor. I've got them. Yeah, it's ground factors, so I've got them down to like negative two, I think. Uh, which means they can't do offensive operations. Uh, so they're, I don't know how much value that is. They're not going to be able to regain ground. Taking this hex was really iffy because it frees up one of their good units. They would have to destroy it, uh, self-destroy it and give me the space or whatever. They could have done that, uh, but it's dead isolated. It'll take them time to rebuild. It costs against their count. What the heck? You know, if I'm, if I'm attacking all out anyway, I might as well throw in those attacks down there. And that's gotten me a couple of spaces, so now I've got fairly good uh, positioning to attack this space and get myself right next to Chongqing because I can negate the river with an attack from this direction. I don't get any kind of breakthrough or anything, but, you know, at least I'm, I'm gaining some ground. And if I can take Chongqing, I think, uh, I think China is in much, much worse shape. All right, well, now we're seeing the pain of gathering storm coming into effect here. Uh, U.S. Axis tensions have gotten to the level where not only, they're actually behind in mobilizations, but they're able to declare war now, <laughs> uh, the U.S. is, and that, spells a certain level of trouble for the Germans. There's no question there. We really haven't been able to do much after the gathering storm situation. You know, I mean, we took off France, cheating. Um, I really ought to have a unit in Paris. I think I failed to SR things as at the end of my turn, and that's what happened there. Let's get these down there, get some forces. Uh, just to protect the beaches to some extent. Also, the Russians are mobilizing. They get another IC. Uh, I've got to add some money to everybody, but uh, and, and record this all in the YSS. It's a lot of paperwork to do every turn, really. I don't know if it's usually as much as this, but because everything's so packed together uh, by Gathering Storm, it's been an issue. I realize for most part, I've been completely screwing up the naval production. Um, it's three BRPs per factor of navy per production cycle. So a big battleship, you know, is going to cost you, like a four point battleship is going to cost you 12 points each time you move it forward. Uh, I think. I don't know. I gotta go face the rule book again. But. That makes these incredibly, incredibly expensive, if that's the case. Um, yeah, it's per factor, it's three points, but you have to pay for it every time it comes around. <laughs> oh, God. In which case I've been, you know, building up fleets for everyone way too cheaply. So I've been screwing it, but not that clearly. I've been paying the cost of the ship every time as one factor for the ship. So like these two point carriers will cost me two points to launch. 
It cost me two points to lay down, two points to launch. Should be three points for each. <laughs> a four point battleship doesn't cost four each time, it costs three each time, but for four turns. I'm gonna say it's close enough. I mean, I'm sure I've made other errors that are probably as drastic, but just haven't noticed them. But yeah, some of my numbers are definitely off. Anyhow, uh, I don't know where I am. I, not much has happened. The, uh, the Brits did a couple of attrition attacks up here. The Chinese trying to cover their space and did an attrition attack. You can see these guys are isolated. Uh, but they actually aren't because this didn't go over the river. So yeah, I can pull them back. The differences between the maps are, uh, is really confusing. Everything is really confusing me. I don't know if it's just my, my mental state here or... Uh, you know, I think it's a combination of this game and my mental state and the way the game is presented in particular. As far as I can tell, with the amount of transports I have here, I was able to SR everything over to Britain, basically. So I got a ton of U.S. troops ready to go do something. Probably going to do a torch landing. Couldn't do it this turn. You can't do an invasion from the U.S. for obvious reasons. But I can do an invasion from Britain, I think. It's got to be like 20 hexes. Mm, maybe I can't. I gotta look that up. It's either uh, it's either 20 or 40 hexes, but I don't know what. It's you know honestly, somewhere over 80 percent of this game is spent either on bookkeeping over here, or the vast majority looking up the rules because so many things are so little differences here, there, and everywhere. And you know again, it's possible maybe to get it all into your head. But it's a much bigger step to do that with this game than it is with, say, World in Flames. It's actually a pretty quick playing game. So if you could hold the entirety of the rules in your head and very quickly, you know, if this were your game to play, you could get through these games much, much more quickly than you could through uh, a World in Flames game. In fact, I, I, I think this probably comes in quicker than even with both maps than Unconditional Surrender does. Um, it may just be because of the weird Gathering Storm situation. But when you add the rules lookups to it, it's up there. <laughs> Fine with the invasion, it's 40 hexes. But you know, to look that up, I had to look in the index, look to the first rule that I could think of, Sea Invasions, find where in Sea Invasions it talks about range, find the rules reference there, that sends me to another place, find that, and then search through it for the actuality of what I wanted to, to see. You know, it takes like a minute or two to do each of these lookups, but in the course of a turn, you have to make so many of them until you're absolutely holding this much rule book in your head, right? <laughs> because there's all kinds of stuff. And, you know, there's no question I'm missing some of it, but like, you know, special rules for each minor country, special rules for this, that, and the other. And it's presented in a way that it doesn't really feel like it's terrible, but I feel myself using up a lot more time to make each rules look up than I did in, say, World in Flames. Um, I think the games are comparable in complexity. It's just this one is designed uh, to be much, much more difficult to learn and to, to absorb for a number of reasons, the way things are bolted on, etc. But there's a lot of rule in World in Flames and a lot of subtlety. Uh, there's a lot in this too, but the way that rule book is presented makes it really difficult to find what you want to find. Anyway, I think I'm done with fall I don't know I'm calling it done um, yes I fixed the situation here let the Chinese build some more troops and whatever and we'll uh, we'll load this one up what is it fall of 41 yay <laughs>